So let's see. I do believe there's also a 15 second lag from the time that I say something until you see it. So there may be a delay in communications, just a forewarning for things to come. Let me check on the other end. I have to flip back and forth between screens as well to see sort of what you guys are this seeing. This is new software, so I... Okay. So I probably Let me check on the other don't end. want that I echoing in the background. Back and forth between... Okay. I'll turn that off. So if you are just joining in, please enter the chat room over to your right and just give me an idea of where you are in your studies or any questions you might have for me. There's a lot of different topics that we could cover today. I'm not sure how long we'll be covering this information because I know there were some issues getting this chat room or this presentation set up. This is not going to be a formal presentation, so I don't have anything scheduled to demonstrate to you, to present to you, not a PowerPoint or something along those lines. However, I'm here to answer any questions, to interact with you personally, to try to get you to the next step of your learning. While I'm waiting for that, I'm just going to play around with some of the settings. I haven't actually been a presenter, a speaker on this. Okay, so it does show the people in the room. I should have known that. I did do some tutorials on this, but I haven't played around with it too much yet. I see you, Sharif. How are you? And Shay, I'm glad to see you on. A few other people. I don't see anyone entering in anything in the chat room, so I think No, the audio should be working fine. If you hear the audio all right, please let me know. In the meantime, we could discuss the giant ugly green thing behind me. So usually when I'm giving a speech or presentation through Zoom, I have the ability to do a virtual background. Um, so far, I haven't found a way to do this. All right, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's it's an ugly green, isn't it? Uh, so we're, another test for today is going to be to see if I can make it this entire space, this entire meeting, without knocking anything over. I have several lights within arm's reach and a very cramped working room here, but <laughs> it'll be a lot of fun trying to juggle that and the correspondence with all of you. <laughs> Did actually get a, a few new things. I actually hooked the green screen from the ceiling today, so that was the project I wanted to get done before starting this. I tried to research how to do a virtual virtual background through this program, but I don't think they'll directly do it. I have to do something with setting up a separate um, webcam program and then streaming that into here, and I just didn't have enough time to figure that out, but maybe next time that'll be available. Well, I haven't had any questions posed yet, so let's just bring up the topic of pre-preparation for studying, because that seems to be a common place that students, well, don't think about too much or completely fail to plan for. And I'm basically going to try to cover a same sort of organization for your study plan as I would in a personal tutoring session with me and somewhat similar to how I cover in the book Read This Before Medical School and for that we do spend the entire first part of the book on preparation on your home life on study skills um, as far as time management goes and certain skills such as those and let's see having notes here on a separate screen as well so I have a lot of different electronics around me right now 
Well, here's a simple thing to discuss. How about ergonomic design, which I'm a perfect example of what not to do currently, but there is a fair amount of research on different aspects of ergonomic design, and the basic thought process behind ergonomic design, I think it was actually started by the military some time ago. I want to say 40s, don't quote me on that. It wasn't something I tried to commit to memory. And the theory is a 90 degree um, angle for most of your body. So you want your spine to be straight, neck to be straight, arms to be able to go straight out, not elevated too much, not leaning too far down. Same with your head. Should be able to see the screen directly in front of you, not tilted down like we usually are on our cell phones or laptops, and not too high. And every aspect of your body, your legs, same thing. That'll help prevent back strain. And something as simple as that is something that most students and educators probably wouldn't think about because, oh, that's probably not related to studying, but it might be. Uh, because what is going to be a, a large hamper on your studying abilities, on the time that you're allowed to sit for one session and study? Yes, mental fatigue will set in too, but back strain, neck strain, that can make you have to uh, be forced to stop much sooner than you planned. Not only that, it'll make you stop your session, but those pains can last for a while, sometimes hours, sometimes days. They can affect your sleep. They can start a vicious cycle that is going to decrease your cognitive abilities in the long run. So it's a small, small little tweak to your study preparation before you even start your study sessions that can make a huge difference over time. And that's what a lot of actual study preparation material is for. It's really to gain that little bit of extra. It's sort of the, the productivity hacks that anyone can implement into their study environment in order to maximize their abilities. Um, another one. Okay, so we get limiting distractions mentioned all the time. It's mentioned on any productivity podcast show, something mentioned to all students, but what can we actually do to limit some of the distractions. Okay, yes, cell phone, we can put that aside. That's an easy one. We can turn off notifications on our computer and close extra browsers. Sometimes that's difficult to do because you might have 12 different tabs up constantly, as I usually do, and you don't necessarily want to close all of those tabs down and lose them. Uh, you could find alternatives to that, copy and paste all of the URLs into like a Word notepad or something a word processor for a little bit and then come back to it later on. It's not a bad way to clear out your your browser too, but what about the visual and audio distractions that are always around? Uh, depending on where you live, who you live with, pets, family, kids, the distractions around you can be uh, socially based, but they can also be environmentally based. Uh, for instance, I live in a very compact area here with a dog that likes to bark every time I'm recording a podcast and trains and planes that come by randomly and you can hear them through my walls very clearly. So obviously for audible noise distraction, something to consider is a good pair of earmuffs or ear protection. Now I do have just earbuds and I have noise canceling headphones, but those don't seem to work as good as a good old-fashioned pair <laughs> of gun range earmuffs. These things can block out most of the so sound for a gun blast, and they're relatively cheap, like $30, I think, 20 30 bucks. That can block out most audible distractions from your study sessions. Um, visual as well, it's nice to have the scenic view over your office or desk if you have one. Most of us probably don't, but if you're lucky enough for that, you still might want to close the blinds for an hour or two if you're doing a dedicated study session. So some of these pre-step or pre-prep areas to consider um, are very, very small, but they're things that you do every single time. You get in a routine of doing them every time, and they can add little extra benefits for all of your study sessions. Now Still have a few of you in the participant pool here, but not partaking in the chat room yet. So I'm wondering, 
if by chance they might be still in the reception area or if they are in the main stage. So if you notice over to the side here there's a couple of different areas and I probably should have closed the others down since we're not using them. I wanted to test out all of them a little bit and currently we're on the main stage. There are sessions, networking, and expo, things that we can do later on once we have more participation in the future, hopefully the near future, and that can allow us to do one-on-one -on -one trainings and have different group sessions and a lot of fun stuff. So I'm really thinking this software might be a great education tool in the future once everyone is a little more used to using it. And uh, of course, if I can make it a regular pattern to be here for you, then everyone will know what day and time to come and meet and have a lot more participation. So, all right. What's another thing we can do for pre prep? Um, okay, so getting into the proper mindset is another vastly overlooked or maybe underappreciated step. So a lot of us might think that we're going to take a few deep breaths and get in the right mindset before a stressful event, before studying, before a test, and then forget to actually do so during the test. And a lot of that might come down to improper practice of certain techniques before a test, such as during our study sessions. If we're doing a study session a few times a week or even every day, and we get into the habit of doing these little tasks, whether it be taking a few deep breaths, before you start or meditating beforehand or even doing a power pose if you have um, heard of is it Amy Cuddy I believe don't quote me on that with the book presence and speaks about imposter syndrome a lot and doing a power pose just a strong physical posture can boost your confidence which can have a uh, not downward spiral opposite a very domino effect in a positive way for your overall academic success. So I try to recommend to students, and I'm not the only one that says this, a lot of people will recommend to prepare your mind while you're doing your study sessions or at all of your at-home sessions because <clears throat> getting into the habit of doing it there, not only will you likely see benefits each time you do that, but you'll have a strong habit so you won't forget to do it when it really counts, when you're going into a testing environment or an interview for a residency or any major potentially life-changing event, you're already stressed out. You don't want to have to increase your cognitive load and think about, oh, I forgot to do this, I forgot to do that. Have a... If you're already in the habit of doing it, it just reduces so much of your mental uh, bandwidth that is required for that. It just becomes habit. And then you're freed up to do other things, to focus on other more potentially more important areas of that session, that meeting, that interview, whatever it might be. Something we also fail to do a lot is just focusing on our lack of focus. It's being mindful of our distractions, noticing when it happens, why it happens, how long we're distracted for. Um, there are some techniques out there that I've heard of, such as every time you realize you're distracted, make a check on a piece of paper and keep that running tally going all during your session or during the week or during the month. It is just an awareness practice really that can let you know maybe certain times of the day are worse than others or maybe the neighbors or your siblings or other family members are being very loud at that period of time so they're your main distraction. Maybe you keep forgetting to put your phone on silent or put it in the other room and leave it there. Whatever the distraction might be, it's good to keep some sort of record of that until you can innately become more aware of these things. We're very, very unaware of when our minds shift from thing to thing, from topic to topic. Mind does it constantly, and until you train yourself to be aware of that, it's really hard to notice, and then if you don't notice it, it's hard to correct. So something as simple as taking a tally mark uh, on a piece of paper every time you have you notice your mind is drifting or maybe you did check your phone because you didn't leave it in another room or you switched to a different browser instead of studying when you said you were going to dedicate this amount of time taking those 
sort of self-assessments as you go through can make you much more efficient in the long run because then you'll start becoming aware of what's causing these problems. You'll start becoming aware of how to change those distracting uh, stimuli or block them out so that you don't become so distracted in the future. So some of those are useful tools. I try not to knock anything over here. Just for preparation, for your pre-study preparation. And we can go into a lot of other things, uh, such as sleep patterns and health and meditation and diet. Actually, a lot of these were recently discussed on an interview I did with Dr. Shay Dada, who is in the chat room now. And that should be up on her Residency Success YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks, I believe. So I don't want to... Uh, go into too much detail about that right now since we have some other things we could talk about but are there any questions or thoughts about other ways to prepare for your study sessions that we can go over or discuss a little bit more because I would like this to be as interactive as possible the more interactive it is the longer I can stay here and chat it up with all of you Nothing in the chat room yet. Okay. All right. So we'll just go on to the next section, which is going to be scheduling and prioritization. So again, this is following a rough outline of some of the materials that I like to cover with a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. So you can actually see how that works as well and then if you do want a more personalized schedule and a lot more details about this you can always contact me and try to schedule something with me. Um, some of the techniques that you hear a lot about would be the Pomodoro which is the little tomato timer that you might see in some older kitchens. <clears throat> uh, if you know the history behind this it's basically a timer that was used in the kitchen. It's shaped like a little um, tomato and the actual technique requires initially or traditionally uh, 20 minutes of activity by usually a five minute break and there's a lot of variations between where the numbers are usually for graduate medical students more accelerated or advanced learners every 20 minutes taking a break is just not really going to happen um, so we might set it for 30 or 50 or 55 minutes and then take it 10 minute break and then do another 55. So that's one that's really popular I hear of for certain types of educational environments and even business environments is like 55, 10, 55. And by studying for about 55 minutes, you're going to be able to get a lot of material done, but you're also going to be quite fatigued at the end of that, whether you realize it or not. So just taking a five, 10 minute break in between can greatly, greatly, um, reduce like the cognitive fatigue and allow your brain to recuperate a little bit and then you could do one more session after that it's really difficult for most people to study at a high degree after about two hours so it's really recommended that you take a longer break at that period whether it be a half hour or an hour then you can come back and do another session later and of course this is going to vary from person to person and your endurance level might be different than someone else's some people are more easily distracted such as myself and some people want to go on and do three or four of these types of repetitions in a day basically throughout the whole day this is common during like a dedicated study period for your board exams <clears throat> So having some sort of planned and scheduled and timed out um, session is very useful. Then you're not just winging it and saying, oh, I think I've been studying for 20 or 30 minutes when maybe you were studying for 10 minutes, got distracted for 20 and then came back for another 10 minutes. Or maybe you've been studying for 45 minutes straight and you're wondering why you're kind of tired because you forgot to set your timer to take a break. You can <clears throat> play around with this a lot and see what works best for you as far as dividing up the time but some sort of actual schedule like set the timer on your phone 
type of practice, getting in the habit of that, can also be very useful because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, should have grabbed some water. Oh well. The um, when you're able to focus intently for short sessions, for short periods of time, whether that be 20 minutes or 50 minutes, 55 minutes, you know that you're not supposed to be doing anything else. You know the timer hasn't gone off. It's sort of increasing your awareness of your focus. At least that's been my experience with it. If you don't have that and you just try to say, oh, I'll look down at my computer screen um, and check the clock there every once in a while, or I'll pick up my phone. Not only are you more likely to be distracted by those electronics, but most of us can't tell time that well, and time is relative. So sometimes, as you know, time will fly by really fast. Other times, it just drags and drags and drags. So having something to keep you honest and keep you on track can make sure that you get the most benefit out of your daily schedules. <coughs> ah, got a really dry throat today. So one of my favorite time management tools actually came from the seven habits of highly effective people. I remember that my folks tried to get me to read that for well, many years when I was younger and never did. And then finally had to about a year and a half, two years ago. And there is a Covey management grid, Stephen Covey being the author. And this was one of the most useful and simple tools to implement that I ever found. And basically his grid is uh, a little square split into four quadrants and you divide them up by what's immediately important, what's important but not immediately, what's less important. Oh, how's it go? It's probably should have looked up the exact terminology he uses. I just kind of use it in generalities. Um, urgent, non-urgent, and then what's the top one? Hmm. Let me look it up so I don't lead you astray. Ah, yes, urgent, non-urgent, important, not important. Should have known that. Even when you quote something multiple times, unless you actively try to put it into long-term memory, it's, it's hard to get it there. So if you have these four quadrants where you have urgent and not urgent in, let's say, the top um, columns, and then the rows being important and not important, so quadrant one is going to be the important and urgent. Now, depending on what type of studying or business you're in, these might be things that you should have done a while ago. Sometimes when things get into the urgent and important area, it's because we procrastinated. So it's best to get in that area emptied as quickly as possible. Then we have the important but not urgent and this is where most of our important tasks should be. This is where a lot of our studying, watch this video, do this practice quiz might be. They don't necessarily have to be done today or any pre-research for a project presentation coming up. Something that does need to be done, it is important, but we have a little bit of time to work on it. And then of course you have the non-important things and that can be anything from a lot of emails, social media, uh, depending on how you want to classify it, maybe hanging out with certain family members or friends. Um, they're not important to the main tasks that we're going for anyway. They're important in other ways. And you want to, within each quadrant, also number them. So let's say quadrant one being urgent and important. We've knocked everything out of there because we're very good at keeping track of time. We are not procrastinating and we have all of our important stuff in the important non-urgent quadrant of things. And while I'm doing this, I think I can actually share my screen. Aha! Should have done this while I was describing it. I'm learning the software, so please forgive me. Yes, here we are. So, if you have everything in the urgent, or important, not urgent quadrant, then you want to number everything in that quadrant too. Which one is the most important? right now, or 
what's the most urgent. And by having that subclassification, you can really focus on one thing at a time. This is the same basic principle that's mentioned in Atomic Habits. It's the same basic principle mentioned in multiple productivity types of material. By dividing them up, we have a general sense of where everything belongs. And then by subcategorizing the level of importance, by numbering them or lettering them, we know which one we have to tackle right now. And something that seems conceptually so simple <laughs> is something that we usually don't do and can make a huge difference in how prod productive our study sessions are going to be. All right, back here. Getting a lot of lag on my screen, so I'm not sure if you guys are as well. I might have too many video things going on here. Um, let's go over one or two more, and then I am going to probably cut off and not do the testing section, the test prep section, or the mnemonic sections here, unless I have some specific requests for them. They can be saved for a later date, because I don't want to take up too much of your time unless we're having a good interaction here, and then I can stay as long as you need, really. So, okay, there are a couple other tools that we mention frequently in Read This Before Medical School, and there is also a free PDF download of the essentials, a bunch of charts and tools that we found very useful when we were writing the book, and those can be found at freemeded.org slash medstudent, so... Put that in the chat there. Um, and one of the ones, I'm not sure if this one in particular is in the Essentials Guide or not, since it's been a while since we wrote that, um, but WHOOP is something that I tried to discuss with a lot of learners and a lot of educators because it's a fairly new term. It stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, and Plan. And when I interviewed um, Dr. Daniel Sadawi Kanafka, I think around episode 31 on the Medical Anemonist podcast, that was the topic that he did research on, that he was studying. And he did it with um, anesthesia residents. And uh, the, the specifics of that research, you would have to go and look. I don't recall all of them right now, but the basic premise for that study and for the studies done before this um, that use the actual name, not WHOOP. WHOOP is kind of an easier to remember term because it stands for, um, what is it? Oh, something with mental contrasting. I think it's MCII. Or mental contrasting with implementation intention. That's the technical term for this process. WHOOP is so much more fun to say. I hope that you guys can see this clearly because it's still very laggy on my side, so I'm not sure if it's just my side or not. Um, but anyway, with Whoop, it basically, you you start off with the wish. What is your wish? What is your goal, in a way? And this is a way to goal set while also preparing for failure. And that's why I really like it and why I find it so strong. And it might work better in certain scenarios than others, but... An example that I've given in the past is <clears throat> if your goal is to drive to the library, then what are the obstacles that can arise from that goal? So we have a wish, go to the library. We have an objective, maybe that's to study at the library or to pick up a book or uh, use the study room there if it's too loud at our house. What are some of the obstacles that can arise? Well, a car could break down or I forget something at home that I need when, when I'm at the library, or maybe I re uh, reserved a study room and it was given away for some reason, or there's somebody in there when it's supposed to be my time. Well, often if these types of unexpected um, obstacles arise and 
obviously these are just sort of mundane ones for this mundane goal, but if your goal is studying for the USMLE or getting into a certain residency or something along those lines, your goals and your potential obstacles are going to be much more severe and much more variable. But we can make a plan for each one of these obstacles by actually writing them down or becoming aware of them. We can say step by step, what would I do if this happened? And just that simple, very simple process of becoming aware of these obstacles and having a plan in place, then if something does happen, we're not going to freak out. We're not going to just be utterly stunned that I can't believe this happened to me today or become extremely frustrated, the cortisol levels rise, and we can't think properly, it ruins our whole day, it ruins our entire plan. So by implementing this very simple strategy, uh, we become aware of our goals more so, we become aware of potential failure points, and then we make strong, if possible, um, plans to get around them. And this just protects us. It makes us much more efficient by not being caught off guard and you know thrown off the path when one of these obstacles do arise. So it's a fun little thing. If you go to whoopmylife.com, you can find some more information on there, and uh, there are some useful videos on YouTube as well. So I have a lot more that we could cover, and I think I'll save that for a future session. How long have we been going? Okay, a little while. About a half hour, a little over. So I think that'll do it. If you have any last minute questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat room. I will still monitor that. And at least for this session, I think we're done. I appreciate you that showed up. And hopefully we'll have more participation in future ones. I'll try to make this a more regular thing. I really just wanted to test out the software here uh, before a festival comes up that we are trying to put together the Online Medical Education Summit. This is probably the software we're going to be using, so I want to make sure I become very familiar with it so we don't have any hiccups during the event. And I figured why not use it to connect with all of you as well. So have a great day. Thank you for joining me and I'll catch you next time.